We're going to finish up section 1.3 by taking a look at limits of indeterminate form functions. What is an indeterminate form function? We're looking at functions that when we try to find the limit by direct substitution, we end up with some indeterminate form such as zero over zero, infinity over infinity, zero to the zero, zero to the infinity, and so forth. These are things that we cannot find the solution to. That does not mean that the limit does not exist. It just means we might have to do a little bit of work or math magic, as I like to call it. For instance, we have the limit as x approaches one of x to the third minus one over x minus one. If I do direct substitution, I get one minus one over one minus one, which is zero over zero. However, you might be tempted to say that this means the limit does not exist, but that is absolutely not true. It just means we have to work a little harder. One technique we can use is called the dividing out technique. And that technique is helpful when we have a rational function. Remember that a rational function just means that you have a function that has a fraction. So both of these are rational functions. And it's helpful when we know that f and g are functions that will agree at all but one point. So for instance, if I wanna find this limit, which we just determined was one, I'm sorry, it was zero over zero, which is indeterminate. So we said it's do not exist, but when we said no, it's really not. But if I plug it in, direct substitution, I don't find the solution. So instead, I can do some work on this. Now, one thing I wanna point out to you, that as you're doing any work, we are not allowed to get rid of the limit as x approaches one until we direct substitute. So as I do my work here, I'm gonna say this is equal to the limit as x approaches one, and then I'm going to factor. So if I factor the numerator, I end up at x minus one because it's a perfect cube. This is a perfect cube root of x and a perfect cube root of one. I write it as x minus one and then x squared plus x plus one. And if you're rusty on the factoring, I encourage you to go back and rewatch some videos on factoring. And then the denominator is obviously x minus one. So what can I do here? I can factor out the x minus one. Now, can I rewrite the function as that? No, but I'm saying that this limit as x approaches one of x squared plus x plus one is going to be the same as the limit as of this function. So now can I do direct substitution? Yes, because if I'm not going to get an indeterminate form anymore because by plugging in one, I can say this is one squared plus one plus one, which is three. So these two functions are the same, they have the same limit. And if you were to graph them, you would find that this function would have a hole at x equals one, whereas this function would not have a hole at x equals one. So they're really the same function, except at the point x equals one. So that's what I'm saying here. If f and g are functions that agree at all but one point, we can often find the limit of one function by dividing out factors and finding the limit of that new function. So let's do one more practice. And if you feel up to it, you can feel free to um, pause this video and try this one on your own. Um, and if you're not, that's okay too. So again, I can't divide, I can't stop writing the limit as x approaches negative three until I actually plug in negative three. And I can't do that yet because if I try to do that, I'm going to end up with zero in my denominator and also zero in my numerator. So no fun, let's see what else we can do. If I factor the numerator, I'm looking for two factors with a difference of um, sorry, that multiply to negative six, but have a difference of positive one. So that would be positive three and negative two. Those, when I multiply them, I get negative six, but when I add them, I get positive one. And then of course I have X plus three in my denominator. So just as I was able to before, I can cancel out those X plus threes. So now I'm saying I'm going to find the limit as x approaches negative three 
of whatever's left, which is x, oops, x minus 2. So now that I am actually going to plug in negative 3, I can get rid of that limit notation. So negative 3 minus 2 is negative 5, and that is my solution. Our next technique also deals with rational functions, which of course means that I have a fraction, but it also contains a radical within the rational function. So again, if I tried to direct substitute, I would get 1 minus 1, which is 0 over 0, which is 0 over 0. So that's an indeterminate form that tells me that I need to work harder. So how am I going to do this? Well, if I want to multiply by the same thing on top and on bottom, so the same in the numerator and denominator, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take whatever function includes the radical and I'm going to find the conjugate. So x plus 1 plus 1. Conjugate means same terms, change the sign. And if I do that in both the numer and the numerator and denominator, it's really like multiplying by 1. So I'm not breaking any mathematical laws by doing this. So now what do I have? Well, I'm going to have the limit as x approaches 0. And in the numerator, if I multiply, so I'm really foiling in the numerator. If I foil that out, I get x plus 1, x plus 1. Both of them are in the square root, but I have it now squared. So that just gives me x plus 1. No longer squared, no longer in the square root. Those two cancel each other out. And then I'm going to get plus x plus 1, plus the square root of x plus 1, and then minus the square root of x plus 1. So those are going to go away. And then I'm going to get negative 1 times positive 1, which is minus 1. So in my numerator, I have x plus 1 minus 1. In my denominator, I have x times, and I'm not even going to multiply that out. A lot of people want to multiply that out, but don't do it. It's just extra work for no reason at all. So now let's see what I can do. If I simplify this a little bit more, again, it's I'm not plugging in 0 yet, so I have to keep writing the limit as x approaches 0. But in my numerator, I have plus 1 and minus 1. So what I have is x, and in my denominator, I have x, and then I've got all of this, x plus 1 plus 1. So as you can probably see, I'm also going to get rid of the x and the x. So really what I'm finding is the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over the square root of x plus 1 plus 1. Well, now can I plug in 0? Now if I plug in 0, I get 1 in my numerator. In my denominator, I get 0 plus 1, so the square root of 1 plus 1. Well, the square root of 1 is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2, so I get 1 half. Before we finish out this section, I do want to point out that I don't often ask you to memorize things, but I'm going to ask you to memorize these two special trig limits. They come up much more often than you might think. They're really good tools to have in your toolbox. I'm not going to go through the proofs for either one of these, though they are in your textbook. Um, but I do want you to note that they're in this section because if I were to find the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x, I would end up with an indeterminate form. Same thing with 1 minus cosine x over x, I would end up with an indeterminate form. So that's why they're in this text, in this video. So let me show you how you might actually use these. So for instance, what if I want to find the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of 4x over x? Now I can't plug in the 0, I get a 0 in the denominator, that doesn't make anybody happy. But what I can do is say, what if I took everything times 4 over 4? Well, that means I've got the limit as x approaches 0. I can put this 4 over here. So now I'm going to have sine of 4x over 4x. And I'm going to put this 4 out front because we talked about the fact that we could do that. So now I'm going to take 4 times the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of 4x over 4x. Well, these are the same, so that limit is 1, according to this definition. So that made that question very easy. I just had to multiply by 4 over 4, which is 1, uh, which didn't change anything. It just made it easier to solve. 
let's look at the next one. 1 minus cosine x over x is 0. So again, if I were going to try to plug in 0 directly, I would end up with 0 in the denominator. No fun for anyone. So instead, let's go ahead and just do a little bit of rewriting here. So this is 6 times 1 minus cosine x. And then in my denominator, I have 3x. So I know, obviously, that I can reduce. I've got a 3 here, and I've got a 6 here, so I'm going to rewrite that as a 2, and I'm just going to bring it out front. So this is now 2 times the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine of x over x. Well, this limit is 0. So really, I have 2 times 0, which of course is going to give me 0. Let's finish up with just two practice. We'll start with one where we can use the dividing out technique. Uh, again, if you feel comfortable, you should press pause and try these questions first before I go through them with you. But back to this one, again, I'm going to rewrite this because if I tried to plug in the four, I would get a zero in my denominator and my numerator. So I'm going to write the limit as x approaches four I'm going to keep the numerator as x minus 4, and my denominator, this is a perfect square, so x plus 4, x minus 4. So obviously I've got something I can cancel out, and so what I'm dealing with here is the limit as x approaches 4, and be very careful. What I find often happens is students will write the limit as x approaches 4 of x plus 4, but remember, the numerator is now just a 1. So this should be a fraction 1 over x plus 4. And now that I have a 4 that I can plug in and I'm not going to get a 0 in my denominator, I can use direct substitution. So 4 plus 4, which is 1 over 8. For my second question, again, I've got a rational function that includes radicals. And if I plugged in zero, I would get an indeterminate form. So let's just use the rationalizing the denominator technique. We are going to take this two plus x and then remember the conjugate. So it's the opposite sign. I'm going to use plus radical two and I'm gonna do that on top and on bottom. So two plus x square root plus radical two. So the hardest part here is just making sure you know how to multiply. So I'm still going to write the limit as x approaches 0. And when I multiply the first two terms, I'm going to get 2 plus x. Because again, we have the square root and then squared, and those cancel. Remember that the o and the i for the FOIL is always going to cancel out because it's going to be plus radical 2 times radical 2 plus x and then minus radical 2 times radical 2 plus x. So all of, always will cancel. So what do I get at the end? I get minus radical 2 and plus radical 2, which gives me minus radical 4, which of course is just minus 2. Denominator, again, I'm not going to multiply x times everything because I'm hoping that the x is going to cancel like it did last time. So what do I have now? Again, I'm still not plugging in 0. I have 2 and then minus 2, so that gives me x in the numerator. And again, if I want to go ahead and cancel on this step, I can do that. So I have x in the numerator, x in the denominator. Now I can only cancel those x's because once I get rid of the 2's, the only thing left up here is x, which makes it a factor, not a term. So you can only cancel factors. So I've canceled out all of the factors now in my numerator, so I just have 1. And in my denominator, I have radical 2 plus x and then plus radical 2. And that gives me, I can go ahead and get rid of that limit now because I'm going to plug in 0. That's going to give me radical 2 plus 0 and then plus radical 2. Well, what does that equal? That means 1 over 2 radical 2. And if you want to multiply it out so there's no radical in the denominator, you can, but I'm not super stickler about that. So if you want to leave it just like this, you sure can. Up next, we're going to discuss continuity. We're also going to revisit that concept of one-sided limits.